Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Tomasz Skiretski. I'm the head of uh, the Department of Translational Immunology and Experimental Intensive Care at the Center of Postgraduate Medical Education um, in Warsaw, Poland. And it is my great pleasure and honor to co-host this seminar today. Um, and our guest speaker is Professor Philan Kim, um, who is an associate professor at the Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology. Uh, he's also the CEO of the Evium Technology um, company. And Professor Kim uh, graduated from the Seoul National University in Korea. Um, he has also been a research fellow at the Harvard Medical School um, in Boston. And he's a leading expert in the field of intravital imaging. And Professor Kim has published more than 100 original papers related to that topic. Uh, and uh, we are, I am really looking forward to his um, talk that uh, hopefully will, you know, inspire us to um, to how can we better understand the biological processes in uh, living organism using this uh, groundbreaking technology of intravital imaging. So, Professor Kim, the floor is yours, and we are looking forward to your talk. That's great. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. And then thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to talk about this intravital microscopy technology. So, yeah, so as you know, some of you already know, the intravital microscopy is a technique for in vivo cellular level imaging of internal organs in a live animal. Okay, so compared to the X-ray or CT or MRI, it only gives you the you know low resolution, relatively low resolution tissue level tissue level information. Compared to that, the intravital microscopy can provide a very detailed live video in cellular level in a live animal model. So the example in the middle is the ten minute video obtained from the lung of a sepsis mouse model. So in this particular example, the green color represents the blood. Right. So basically you are looking at the capillaries, and the one arterioles uh, in the lung. And then the red color is uh, a neutrophil. So we label the neutrophil by injecting antibody conjugate with the profile that can specifically label the neutrophil inside the blood vessel. And then in this video in the middle, what you can see is this neutrophil is very active, right? So they move very, you know, actively. And then suddenly it makes a small cluster in the middle and then it blocks this arterial in the middle, right? So again, so this, you know, neutrophil make a cluster and the blood flow, you know, fully disturbed and then uh, stopped. Okay, so this is one of the, you know, key several level, you know, dynamic things happens in the sepsis uh, mouse model. So, yeah, so it's the same video. So this is how we do. Uh, so so this in this case, in this particular example, the mouse is intubated and then, you know, connected to the ventilator. Uh, and in the middle, uh, this is a long window, imaging window chamber. So if you can see here, we have a small suction hole here. So we can suck out the air uh, from the, this chamber and then build up the negative air pressure inside. And by doing that, we can stabilize the motion of the lung like this, you know? So it's just a part of the lung, but it's just stabilized against the, this transfer of the cover glass. And then after that, after this preparation, we can take this kind of a uh, stabilized video from the lung of this mouse. So this is another example. So, well, maybe some of you already know that. Uh, so in this case, in this example, we anesthetize the mouse model. So it's sleeping. And then we insert the rectal probe through the anus to monitor the body core temperature uh, during our imaging. And then we feedback control the heating pad to keep the body temperature of this mouse to be stable at 36 to 37 degrees during the imaging. And then we make a small surgical procedure to expose the popliteal lymph node in here. And then we take uh, this uh, live video again in several level. 
from the, this papillary lymph node. Uh, so in this particular example, so in the middle, we are looking at the uh, one vessel called high endocellular venue. And then the red color is a T cell and green color is a B cell. And blue color is a fibroblastic reticular cell that surrounds the, this uh, high endocellular venue. And then this arrow uh, indicates the position of the extravagation of this T cell and B cell, for example, here. Yeah, so you can see that you know, this extravagation of a B cell and also a T cell at later time point. Okay, so this is you know, just a you know, good example. The intravital microscopy is a very good, a very useful technique that can track the you know, several level you know, process in a live mammal, in a live animal model. Now, well, not only cell, so we can also image the drug as well. As long as, so as long as we can label the drug fluorescently. So in this particular example, what you're looking at is the real time video obtained from the liver of this mouse model. So again, so we use the lactide pro, use the heating pad. And in this particular example, we use type two GFP mouse model. Uh, it's a trans mouse. So in this mouse, all the vascular endocellular cell express GFP, the green process protein. So we don't need to label the uh, vessel in this case. So, and then when we look at the liver, so these are the, you know, liver sinusoid, you know, so liver sinusoid endocellular cell uh, strongly express GFP in green, you can see here. And then uh, let me stop the video. So when I started this video, that's when we inject the, uh, this red color uh, nanoparticle through the tail vein. So in this example, the tail vein is actually catheterized. And then uh, when we start the recording, we start the injection of uh, uh, the intravenous injection of a nanoparticle. And then this is the video. This is the result. So we are, you know, so after roughly you know, 10 seconds, we can see this flowing, you know, nanoparticle. Uh, inside the uh, sinusoid, liver sinusoid in the liver. And then we can, you know, quickly see the, how this, you know, nanoparticle started to accumulate inside the, uh, this liver sinusoid in real time, as you can see in here. Okay. So this is just a 30 second, 30 second video. So it's, you know, it's really the very first moment uh, of the uh, delivery of this nanoparticle to the liver in this example. But we can extend it even more. So this is another example of uh, drug delivery to the uh, tumor model. Uh, so in this particular example, uh, we make a, a cancer genomic model uh, of a, a human breast cancer cell by using human breast cancer cell, HMDA MB231 GFP. So it's breast cancer cell. And then we use the dosage skin pore chamber uh, as you shown in here. So this dosage skin pore chamber, that can be implanted on the back of the uh, noodle mouse model like this. And then in the middle, we inject this GFP expressing breast cancer cell and then let it grow for several weeks. And then we anesthetize this mouse and then inject the uh, nanoparticle through the tail vein again. And this is two hour, six hour, and 24 hours after the injection of the nanoparticle. And then let me show it here. So, uh, and then we label the vessel again. Uh, in, in this case, we by injecting the antibody, the CD31 antibody, uh, flow for conjugate, we can label the vessel. And then when you look at the, this red color, red signal, we can see how this nanoparticle is delivered uh, to the tuber tissue in the middle. And then how, the, how this you know, nanoparticle you know, get out from the uh, vessel and then delivered to the, uh, the cancer cell here. For example, in here, and then you get here. And then this is a 24 hour observation. So what we did was we imaged this mouse for six hours and then we, you know, let the mouse to wake up and then keep it under the, in the, uh, cage and then bring the same mouse again and a size again and then find the exact same location at 24 hours time point and then see how this, you know, delivery of the nanoparticle, you know, changes over time. Okay, so I show I, I show you know you know several examples already. So the intravital microscopy is a very useful technique that can enable a dynamic 3D imaging of various several level dynamics, such as cell trafficking like this, or cell to you know cell to cell or cell to microenvironment interactions 
is like their live uh, animal modeling people. And then, you know, as I showed in these two examples, the food drug development, also this intermittent microscopy can enable a direct image analysis of drug delivery to target tissue and or to target cell. And then later, we can also monitor the drug efficacy in the target cell using fluorescence biomarker. And then we can, and then at the same time, we can also validate the model of action of that drug. Again, in a live animal model in vivo. So uh, in my group, and then also our, uh, my computer, IBM technology have been able to image almost every internal organ and tissue in a live mouse model. So for example, it includes like bone marrow, well, brain, brain tumor in the bone, uh, in the brain, well, retina, skin, and this is the follicle inside the skin. And all these images was obtained from the live mouse model under anesthesia. And then various tumor model, well, this is pancreas, spleen, the GI tract, various adiposite tissue, prostate, lymph nodes, and the placenta in a pregnant mouse model, memory tissue, and then kidney, liver, heart, lung, thyroid, and trachea, and so on. So this, you know, this list of the uh, organ is just keep increasing. So, you know, uh, we used to, to obtain those live video from the live mouse model. Uh, we used this dual mode intravital compact point and two photon microscope uh, called uh, CMS3, IBM CMS3. So as you can see in this picture, it's uh, you know all in one package. It uh, optimized system for uh, in vivo cellular level intravital imaging of live animal model. So it's a single box design. So everything is inside. So we can easily install it, and then we can also save the cost and space. And it's quite easy to use for you. So we can. Uh, so it, it's very easy to use. You don't need to. So you can control everything uh, outside the box. And then also this, uh, this microscope uh, is equipped with a compact 920 nanometer femtosecond first laser for two photon imaging with four different colors. And then we can also connect the uh, four wavelengths CW laser for compact color imaging. It's also you know, with, uh, uh, simultaneous with the four colors. And then we have additional optical ports for additional, uh, another you know, optional you know, optical ports in the uh, backside of this mouse uh, microscope box for additional laser connections, like uh, conventional, you know, tunable titanium sapphire femtosecond pulse laser system for two photon imaging. So let me show you in a, some short uh, in a introduction videos. So in case you want to connect the, uh, uh, the tunable laser, you know, we can connect it like this. So this is the uh, tunable laser, the tiny sapphire tunable laser, and then we can connect it to the uh, back of this microscope. And then, you know, it has a single box design. So when you open up in the middle, we have a sample stage inside under the objective lens, and then we can slide it out like this, and then we can set up the uh, mouse model. We want, we want to image this like this. And then we can, you know, select the objective lens we want to use, and then close it, and then we can find the focus like this. So laser beam is coming in, and then we can get the uh, higher resolution uh, library uh, images from that. And as I told you, it can do uh, full color uh, compocal de detections, imaging, and also it can do you know full color uh, two photon uh, imaging as well at the same at the same time in a uh, not in the same time, but sequential manner. But it's just a single you know box system. Okay, so uh, yeah, maybe of you already know the compact microscope. In, inside the compact microscope, we use PINO to detect the fluorescence signal from out of focal volume, and then uh, thereby we can you know take uh, you know uh, tomography, you know section the image uh, from the uh, live tissue. So in very in very high resolution. So this is uh, you know one good example of that. So in this example. Uh, what you are looking at is inguinal adipose tissue in anesthetized mouse model of adiponectin 3 MTMG mouse. So, so adiponectin is expressed in the adipocyte, of course. So in green, you can see the adipocyte. And then in red color, you can see the other, you know, all other cells like endocellular cell and some other immune cells. 
and then this is a four micrometer interval uh, G stack images, G stack images taken from the uh, the inguinal body tissue of this mouse model. And then you know later you know of course we can you know make a 3D rendered video like this, very you know very high resolutions. And then if you look at carefully in this video, so you can see this small you know micro vesicle shed out from this uh, this adipocyte in the middle, like this. And then, you know, to, in case of two photon microscope, uh, we use intra, uh, infrared, you know, pentacycle pulse laser for two photon excitation. And thereby, we can excite the only focal volume, very small focal volume. So we don't need the uh, pino. But at the same time, like the convocal microscope, we can take, you know, 3D imaging by g imaging. And then one additional feature of two photon microscope is second harmonic generation imaging, uh, in short, SHG. And this second harmonic generation signal is very effectively generated from the collagen microtubule and other regular fib protein fibers in biological tissue uh, like this. So it's quite useful uh, to image the collagen so to study the uh, fibrosis mouse model. So this is one example. So in this case, the red color is a repeated droplet labeled by fluorophore. So it's a process, the red color is process imaging. And the green color is actually second harmonic generation signal uh, generated from the fibrotic collagen uh, in this tissue. Actually, this is a liver. So, you know, and then, you know, our microscope, the CMS3 microscope, can image the both uh, simultaneously uh, second harmonic generation signal from the collagen, and then GFP, RFP, and then the far red signals. So, so it's capable of poor color imaging. So this is one example uh, obtained from the skin of H2B GFP and Loja 26 MTMG mouse. So in white color, you can see the normal collagen. So this is G-stack data. You can see the nucleus, nuclei of individual cell. You can see the membrane of other uh, cells in red color. And white color, that's uh, normal collagen. And, and then this is another example from obtained from the muscle. So it's all obtained from the you know, anesthetized mouse model. So you can see the myocyte, and then you can see the sarcomere uh, filament inside the myocyte, and then you can see the multiple nuclei of the myocyte, and then you can see the vessel in blue color. And this is another data obtained from the uh, pancreas of a mouse model. So you can keep, uh, we can keep going. So this is the op image, op uh, image data obtained from the kidney of a live and exercise mouse model. So you can see the individual tubule and then capillaries uh, and the nuclei in the epithelial cells and then tubular cells as well and so on. This is the data obtained from the spleen. And then after you know, taking this GSTEC data, uh, we have our own software for 3D visualization like this and also 4D visualization as well. So 3D imaging, uh, in time lapse manner, so you can see the you know movement of the individual cell in a three D volume like this. So yeah, another day, another example. You know, we just you know rotate. So you know when you compare the compocal and two photon microscope, it's complement to each other. So for compocal microscope, the advantage is it's easy to use and they're very efficient in process imaging, and then it's, it's you know it's very easy to do multicolor imaging with a convocal microscope. And for two photon microscope, our imaging depth can be extended further up to uh, 500 to 700 micrometer. So for deeper tissue imaging, two photon microscope has an advantage. Uh, and then the unique feature or unique, unique, uh, unique thing, unique advantage of this uh, CMS3 model is it's equipped with high-speed laser scanner for real-time imaging. So it's capable of 30 to 100 frames per second imaging with 512 by 512 pixels. So by using ultra fast, you know, polygonal mirror scanner, we can achieve uniform illumination over entire imaging field of view. And then we can achieve very high speed uh, optionally up to 100 frames per second. But our default system is capable of 30 frames per second. And then 30 frames per second imaging is, uh, you know, fast enough to, you know, visualize the uh, flowing cell. Uh, in this example, the flowing red blood cell in the vessel of this tumor mouse model. Uh, so again, so in this example, the red color is actually vessel 
the endocellular cell. It's labeled by intravenously injected anti CD thirty-one antibody conjugate with the flow force. And then, uh, well, as you can see here, this is how we do it. So we take up the small amount of the blood, and then we label the uh, red blood cell with the far red dye, BID, and then we can inject it back. So in this green color, it's a pseudo color actually, that's the uh, red blood cell. The red color is the best, uh, the endocellular cell. And green color is the pseudo, uh, it's also pseudo color of the tumor cell, the red HGF cell. But anyway, the key thing in here is we can see the very fast phenomena in the mouse model in video rate imaging. So again, during the long, again, we can see the flowing red blood cell uh, through the capillary, uh, in this, as shown in this example. And also we can obtain you know, this kind of flowing cell imaging in other tissue like uh, uh, heart, for example, in here. So well, in here, we use the same principle. We suck out the air through this, uh, through this tube, so build up the negative air pressure, and then stabilize the uh, heart, the beating heart. And the small part of the heart is stabilized against the transparent cover glass in here. And then you know, our system is capable of 30 frames per second video rate imaging, so we can you know, directly see the uh, flowing cell inside the vessel of this heart. And then very recently, we make uh, AI processing algorithm to reduce the noise in this real-time video. So this is the real-time video we obtained uh, with our microscope. And then we can process uh, using our AI network model and then very effectively, very efficiently, you know, remove the noise and then make this process data. So you can nicely see this point in a red blood cell in the uh, capillary of the ear skin of this mouse model. Uh, so another example, so people, uh, this is low data, and this is after uh, AI processing for noise reductions. And then this is from the kidney. So this is our low data, and then this is our uh, process, AI process data. So we can keep the resolution, temporal resolution, and spatial resolution uh, at the same time. Okay. And then in addition to that, we, uh, this high speed, you know, imaging capability, give us a unique another you know, additional advantage like uh, live tissue motion compensation. So, you know, as you can imagine, as you, as you already seen in the video, our real-time video, although the mouse is anesthetized, it's sleeping, but still the heart is beating and the lung, you know, it also breathing air, breathing, the mouse should breathe air. So lung expand and shrinks, right? So, you know, every, you know, internal organ has, uh, you know, motion, you know, under the, and then under the microscope, the motion is quite severe like this. And our approach is just, uh, quite straightforward. And you know? we take her, uh, this real time video, and then we do the frame by frame, you know, image registration to compensate the motion. And then by doing that, we can increase the uh, SNR. So this is one example. So, and then, so this high speed imaging and motion compensation is very critical to achieve, to get this high resolution image from the moving tissue in a live mouse model. So you can compare the with motion compensation and without motion compensation from this, you know, video rate videos. Another example. So this is very, you know, typical, very typical movement of the live tissue under the microscope, under the uh, microscope objective lens. So and then you can clearly see we definitely need this motion compensation function to get very high resolution, the sub micrometer resolution in a, in, from the, this live tissue. And then our software, had, you know, it automated this motion compensation. So this is a real video. So just activate the uh, motion compensation function. And then just one single click of the button then you will get this motion compensated image out of this real-time video. And then in addition to that, uh, when you imagine the live animal, live animal imaging, you need to you know, keep the mouse to be stable. So we need additional feature. So for example, we need to you know, keep the body temperature to be stable. And then to do that, we have a, uh, this, we use this lactate probe and the body plate the heater like this. And it's quite important because under anesthesia, the mouse body temperature drops very quickly within 20 to 30 minutes 
the mouse temperature can drop more than three to four degrees. And then you don't want that. And then we you know, definitely don't want that. So we definitely need this kind of feedback control over the heating system and their, uh, their temperature sensors. In addition to that, uh, when you open up uh, our microscope, we have uh, this sliding mechanism. So we can slide in, out the stage like this, and then we can set up the uh, mouse model in it. And then we can put it back like this, and then close the door. Okay, so that's how our microscope you know, works. And then the, the features, the unique advantage of our microscope system. Uh, from now on, now let me give you more example of these all different organizing. So this is the preparation for the uh, EOS skin imaging. So like this, so mouse is anesthetized, and then we use this uh, U-shaped bracket, and then uh, we place the uh, transparent cover glass in this U-shaped bracket. And then we attach the uh, ear skin against the, this cover glass in here. And then you know, after the preparation, you know, we can obtain this you know, uh, timeless video of this mouse, uh, mouse ear skin. In this example, uh, what you're looking at is the, uh, in green color, it's uh, uh, neutrophil and macrophage. Uh, and then in this example, we use lysozyme M uh, GFP transient mouse model. And then uh, the vessel is labeled by uh, CD31 antibody conjugate. And then, you know, we can do many things. Uh, this is one of the work we published in JCB in 2017. So in this example, we inject one uh, purified protein, KRS, uh, in the middle using a microinjector. And then see the, you know, uh, what happens, basically. Uh, and then you can see this is three hour and six hour after this intradermal injection of KS protein. And you can see uh, this huge and very really active you know, infiltration of neutrophil and macrophage to the injection site like this. Well, and this is a you know, bone marrow imaging. So for bone marrow imaging, uh, we normally image the cranium, the skull of the mouse model. And then, well, the good thing of this imaging is that this uh, score is very thin. So without uh, any, you know, uh, pro any process, we can just simply, you know, penetrate to the bone marrow of the disc called the cranial bone. And then this is the repetitive, you know, so we image the same mouse uh, repeatedly at day one to day four uh, after the transplantation of the bone marrow cell. And so you can see from day three to day four, you can see the increase to, uh, the proliferation of this uh, transplant one by cell in red color. And this is how, you know, what happens of this one single cluster looks like. So you can see this one, uh, this one thing in here, and this is the wide area mosaic image. This one cluster, it looks like this. So it's just a cluster of multiple transplanted bone metal cell. And we can see the you know, active you know, proliferation. For example, in here, if you look at here, you can see the proliferation of these cells. And this is everyday imaging. So from day two to day 10. So you can see how this transplanted cell proliferate like this and disappear and then proliferate again. So this several level you know, changes can be tracked down for up to several weeks in several level in a live mouse model. Uh, yeah, and then it, this is the example I showed, I already explained it for the liver imaging. Uh, let me give you another example. So this is another example we published in 2020. So in this example, we imaged the liquid droplet accumulation in the non ancolic uh, petty liver disease mouse model. So you can see uh, seven days, 14 days, and, uh, and then 21 days like this. And then you can see how this yellow color liquid drop like you know, increase uh, inside the liver uh, of the mouse model, like this, from day two to day 21. So this is a very good example. So we can see the several level changes over extended period of time, like uh, several weeks uh, in the same mouse model. And then, you know, uh, by using the second amortization signal, we can also monitor the collagen and then to in the end, then we can evaluate the uh, fibrosis uh, in this mouse model. 
uh, this is the example of the uh, small uh, the small intensity imaging. So in this particular example, uh, it's quite old work actually, published in JCA 2015. So we extract the small intestine and expose the lumen like this, and then we drop the present periaxide in red color, and then see how those in you know, a present periaxide uh, absorbed through the single villi in here, and then transported through the uh, lymphatic vessel uh, inside the mesh tree. So you can see from uh, zero minute to 26 minute, you can see this red color, uh, this periaxide, transported through the mesenteric uh, lymphatic vessel in here. So uh, in this example, we use Proxon Jeffrey Mouse model. Okay, so another thing is, uh, uh, so we, there are you know, various you know, imaging window technique for internal organ, longitudinal, repeated uh, internal, organ, uh, internal organ imaging, like the dosaskimple chamber, abdominal imaging window, and cranial imaging window. So let me give you the example of the dosa skin point chamber surgery. So uh, yeah, I already showed you. So, so we stretch the dosa skin like this, and then you know tightly fix it, and then make a suture <laughs> to fix the uh, dosa skin, and then we remove the uh, uh, the skin like this and expose the subcutaneous area. And then what we do was uh, uh, we inject the uh, process, uh, fluorescent, you know, cancer cell in the middle, and then uh, close it uh, with a transphatic glass like this. And use your uh, ceiling to uh, make a you know, tightly ceiling like this. And then after uh, this procedure, uh, we can image the mouse model for extended view for uh, repeatedly for quite a long time, like 24 hours. Well, it can even more than that. So it is a three-day interval uh, imaging of the same mouse model at the same location at day seven to day 13. So you can see how this GFP expression cancer cell changes over time, and then how the uh, vessel you know, also changes like this. And this is the abdominal image window. So we can image the liver, pancreas, spleen, and kidney by using this image window. Actually, this is a ring-shaped window like this. And then we can image the pancreas by spleen like this. Uh, and then this is another example. So in this example, uh, in this particular application, we implant it into the uh, side of the mouse model. And then we place the uh, pancreas in the middle. We, and then we inject the pan mouse pancreatic cancer cell, panco 2 GFP cell in here. And then we can, we can again, we can give the same mouse repeatedly. So, and then, we, and then this is exactly the same location from day 9 to day 14. And then you can see how this panco 2 GFP cancer cell proliferate and then how, how the uh, tumor vessel density you know, increased. Actually, we can do it in every day from day 9 to day 14. And then you can see the you know everyday change. You can track down the everyday changes of this uh, cancer pancreatic tumor cell and the uh, vessel. The cranial imaging window is another technique. So it's a, it's a surgical procedure to remove the skull, the small part of the skull, and it's removed by uh, using a drill. The skull opening with a drill, with the three millimeter diameter, and then. Uh, we live with the skull and put the transfer the cover glass. And then, you know, we surround, uh, we put the uh, dental cement in the exposed area. And then uh, the UV curing, UV curing, you know, dental cement. And then we can seal it up to every, every, you know, exposed area. And then we can image the brain uh, through the, this glass window. So this is a uh, wide area uh, g stack images after this uh, surgical procedure. So you can see the vessel or individual uh, capillaries. This is actually meninges. And then now we are getting into the cortex and you can see this uh, capillaries, nuclei, and then penetrating vessels. And this is the work we published uh, last year, actually. So in here, in this particular example, we induced the photosorombosis in the penetrating arterial. Uh, so blocked one single arterial and then observe the tissue level changes for up to 30 days. 
And then also we can, you know, monitor the leakage of the uh, dye uh, from the, uh, this vessel. So, so you, if you look at here, this red color, so it's the same location at day zero, day three, and day five. And then this red color is intravenously injected dextra with a size of a three kilo dalton. So you can see the, you know, leakage of this dextran, three kilo dalton dextran at day three. But, you know, it is stored, it liquid is stored at day five. So it, this data suggests the transient DBV dysfunction in terms of vascular leakage. Uh, at day three and day, and then recovery of day five. And then this is the, uh, this is the cellular level phenomena, what happened during those recovery phase. So we can see the recovery of the phase static vessel coverage in this recovery process, like this. So if you look at it, this NG2 is actually parasite. So you can see this parasite processes stretched along the vessel and then Later, at day five, we can recover the uh, DBV function. Uh, the vascular leakage was recovered. Okay. So I showed you, you know, several examples, you know. So we can, again, you know, we can image the, you know, all different organ. And then we have a solution for the longitudinal, you know, repeated imaging of these various tissues and organs. So if you're interested, so please visit our website, www.ivimtech.com. Or if you have any questions, just send, uh, please send us an email to, uh, to this address, email address. So if you visit here, uh, and then one addition to that, so this single box system, it's a full closed system. So we, it's quite small, uh, less than a, uh, one meter by one meter. So we can put it in the very small space. And in addition to that, we have a customization option, like uh, this. if you want to image the larger animal and then with the more flexibility, then we can give you, we can provide this customized system as well. And then if you visit uh, our website, we have uh, you know, uh, information, you know, example study of the various disease model, like acute injury model and various chronic disease model, like uh, fibrosis or fatty liver disease, or other brain disorders as well. And then we have a bunch of webinar series on Nodid in our website. So if you are interested in specific uh, topic like a peptide and nanoparticle imaging, then we have a video here, uh, the webinar series in here, like or exosome dynamics, what GI tract imaging, uh, for example, etc. And then we also provide uh, uh, imaging uh, service as well. So as a you know, contract research service, you know. So we have our own uh, in-house animal facility and then uh, imaging that. So if you send that, if, if you have you know, some material or whatever imaging uh, you want to test it with the specific mouse model, you know, just ask us, then we can do the, all the you know, imaging experiment and they provide you the result. Uh, this was actually one example we have done, published in Science Advances at 2020. So this was in an exosome uh, imaging in the sepsis mouse model. 10 minutes and 30 minutes after the exosome, uh, exosome injection. So we can see this red color is exosome actually. And then we can see only after 10 minutes, this exosome rapidly attached to the, this target cell and then internalized. Okay. So uh, IBM, the IBIM, the IBM, we, we pronounce it IBM, IBM technology. Uh, provide you the uh, all-in-one you know, intravital compound coloring to photon microscopy system. We also provide the uh, intravital imaging service. And then we also have our own you know, in-house specialist team with the know-how and experience of intravital imaging more than 10 years. So we can consult you to how to you know, design the intravital imaging experiment with the live animal model. And then we can also provide in-depth technical support to optimize your uh, intervention imaging uh, study. And also we provide the training service as well, uh, like the surgery, surgical procedures, and then imaging and the imaging processing and so on. Okay. So that's all uh, today. So thank you very much for your attention. And then I will be happy to answer you know, any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kim, very much for your excellent talk and very, I think it's, it was very uh, inspiring uh, and informative uh, for all of us. Um, are there any questions from 
the audience. Okay, personal team, do they mm -hmm. understand well that uh, the two photon um, mm -hmm. uh, mode uh, enables imaging of collagen without any additional stainings? Yeah, exactly. Yes. Okay, so, so we, we don't need any um, reporter mice or any dyes, right? No. It's just. Yeah. Just the two photon microscope <laughs> with, uh, and then detecting the second number generation signal. Okay, and, and it can be combined with some other fluorochrome uh, yeah, based. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So let me go back to the example. So I showed you, yeah, this example. So, yeah, so this scheme might be the good example. So this is in a simultaneous second amount generation, the collagen and process imaging and done at the same time. So green color is GFP. So you know, the green press protein, red color is a TD tomato, and blue color is actually advanced blue. Uh, it's a far red, uh, it has a strong presence in far red colors. So this three color, green, red, blue is presence signal. And then in addition to that, we can combine, we can take the, we can obtain the, this collagen uh, imaging by using second imagination signal. So it can be done simultaneously. Okay, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And I have one more question uh, regarding the cell death imaging. You, you mentioned mm -hmm. this very briefly, but could you elaborate a bit more? What are the possibilities to monitor the cell death uh, in the real time or may maybe any different types of cell death? Is it really uh, possible to validate it in a way? And how? Okay. Uh, well, in case of apoptosis, you know, we, we can use the NXGM B antibody staining in vivo to you know to determine whether this is whether we are looking at apoptosis or not. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, we have also have you know used the propodyne iodide, the PI, for necrosis yeah. imaging as well. Yeah. That can be done in vivo. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And if I can ask you one more question, mm -hmm. and, uh, this is maybe a more technical one. This is mm -hmm. a problem with any all kind of dynamic studies that uh, you need to find the right time point for your observation <laughs> to get the process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Could you maybe give us any tips or how how do you approach this otherwise than doing multiple, mm -hmm. you know, trials just to catch this time yeah. frame when you can okay. uh, yeah. observe the, 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 the right process? Okay, is it, well... Unfortunately, there is no common rule for that. Uh, it's just still, you know, kind of a tried and error. So, you know, what, what I normally do, what we, what I normally do is, uh, we try to image the, uh, mouse model as long as possible. So we, you know, keep the mouse model, you know, for like uh, several days or several weeks and then try to observe the, you know, the whole changes in the same mouse model. And then when we find the, you know, the right time, then, then we just focus on that time point with another with other mouse. So well, still it's quite a difficult question, you know. So that's the you know one very practical, you know, hurdle you know we need to <laughs> we need to overcome in the beginning of the this uh, the design the design of the this in the interval limiting experiment. Okay. I'm Thank sorry you. for yeah, I'm sorry if there is no you know kind of a shortcut <laughs> for that. Uh, and then I have one question here in Q and A window. So how many hours can long imaging uh, be observed? Okay. Uh, so uh, after this setting, we can image up to uh, two hours. That's the um, the that's the kind of common you know time length we can keep the mouse to be alive. Uh, with this surgical procedure. And, and then, well, but the, even after this uh, imaging, we can still suture, we can close the, uh, we can close the, uh, this thoracic cavity and then let the mouse to recover uh, from this surgical procedure and then repeat the same imaging in the same mouse model. Although the success rate is not that high, so well, still, we, uh, in with some practice, we can save up to uh, fifty percent, fifty to sixty percent of the mouse 
app to this such uh, app to this long imaging. Uh, well, let's put this and then for well, but for other organ, you know, but this thoracic cavity is difficult, you know. But for other tissue like uh, you know peripheral tissue like uh, lymph node, well, we can extend it more than easily more than six to seven hours, even twenty four hours in a single imaging session. And then in case, uh, well, even for the liver, you know, we can image up to six to seven hours. Mm -hmm. And then for that, you know, long-term imaging, definitely we need a heating pad to keep the uh, body temperature to be stable. And then uh, in one example, I think I showed you the 24-hour imaging, 24-hour continuous imaging so in the brain, for example. Oh, yeah, here. So this is, you know, if you look at it, this is actually 24-hour imaging in the brain. So in this case, you know, we, you know, mouse is keep anesthetized, so it's fixed under the, uh, our objective lens, and the mouse temperature is maintained by using the heating pad. And then, you know, every, and then we also use the, uh, the, uh, the inject automatic injection system I think the intraperitoneal injection system to provide the water and glucose for the mouse to be alive during for uh, for twenty four hours. Okay, another question is: Do you think the limited spatial resolution and depth of the field, as well as a limited single photon color excitation and the impossibility of moving the lens during imaging? Can be drawback to using intravital microscopy. Well, yes, it is. <laughs> yeah, of course, you know, you know, of course, it is a it, it is a practical limitation, you know, of this, you know, live animal intravital microscopy. Mm -hmm. Well, but spatial resolution is well, it's up, it's a. 0.5 micrometer. Uh, so 0.5 micrometer is, uh, I think it's enough, you know, uh, spatial resolution to see the many, you know, subcellular level things, subcellular level phenomena. And the, in terms of the depths, you know, still, you know, that's true. Our penetrating depth is normally limited to uh, 100 micrometer for concopical microscope, for microscope, and then 300 to 500 micrometer with the two photon microscope. So definitely that's the limitation, of course. But still, you know, there are many things we can do it with, within that, you know, depth of field. Uh, and then moving the lens is uh, actually it's another story. So what we can do is uh, we can do multi position, you know, you know, so we, we have, a, so our stage is uh, uh, motorized. And then we can program our stage to move around multiple position uh, repeatedly over uh, with the you know time interval. So, for example, what they have done we we image the five, we observe the five you know different location uh, in with the one minute interval. So what we do was we take, we observe one we observe we take an image at one spot, move it to another spot. Take an image with another spa, take an image. So we do it at five, uh, we do it in five different locations and come back to the first location, first spa, and then take an image again. So just, you know, repeatedly observe the sequentially and repeatedly observe multiple position in the mouse model. So what, and this, that's how we extend our uh, imaging field of view. And then it's, you know, automated with our stage. I have a few quick questions. Uh, sure. Uh, first, you are talking about uh, mouse imaging. Mm -hmm. Do you ever try to image rats? Because oh, you are very interested in, in mm -hmm. rats. Do mm -hmm. you ever see any difficulties or? Well, not, not really. So we have done that imaging also many times, uh, but not just a handling issue, you know. <laughs> as long as you can exercise the lab, then it's not a problem. And then the other, the other thing is uh, we don't have many translating that. 
So Jeff be expressing that. There are very few, you know, Jeff be expressing transcending that model. So we normally need to use antibody flow, antibody or additional exogenous dye to label the cell. So we need to use a lot of antibodies <laughs> to label the cell in the lab. In the lab. So well, that's, the, that's the difficulty. And other than that, it's quite similar to mouse imaging. And then, you know, for your information, our uh, stage, the mouse stage, can handle up to uh, one kilogram. So it's enough to handle the lab with our translation stage. Certainly. And okay. one more. Uh -huh, sure. Uh, regarding the uh, maximum depth of uh -huh. imaging. Uh -huh. Because uh, there are uh, some inconsistencies, inconsistencies in your in the data. What's the maximum depth you can uh, image? Is it uh, 700, 500, or 300 micrometers? Okay. Mm, what, okay. what I am alluding to is we would like to image coronary blood flow. And mm -hmm. uh, there are crucial differences between mm -hmm. the coronary blood flow in most superficial mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and deeper layers. And it is the very, uh, the most interesting part is to image those deep layers because they are uh, subject to uh, intramenocardial pressure. And mm -hmm. what, yeah, what in your okay. experience would be the maximum mm -hmm. depth of imaging? Mm -hmm. Okay, this imaging depth, it depends on the tissue and organ, right? Yeah. So the 700 micrometer can be achieved with the brain only. <laughs> so brain is quite transparent. Brain, you know, in optical resolution, in optical wavelengths, brain is very transparent. So the brain is the only organ we can achieve 700 micrometer. And then, but other tissue, it depends, you know. Liver is difficult. And then muscle, you know, we can penetrate up to 200 micrometer. And then, in case of a heart, so this is our heart imaging example. Uh, unfortunately, heart is uh, you know, difficult to penetrate. So there is a lot of blood, so it's very difficult to penetrate. So in our experience, in case of a heart, we can penetrate up to 100 micrometer, 100 micrometer more or less. So it's quite superficial still. So that's my experience with the heart coronary artery imaging. <laughs> Okay, thank you yeah. so much. Yeah. Okay, we have another question in Q&A. Uh, okay, so with the IBM, is it possible to accept the process in the tissue of interest to collect the low levels of in-focus light emitted from it? Yes, separate this signal from the potentially overwhelming noise of out of focus Oh yeah, of course. So. Both of a confocal microscope and two photon microscope is capable of uh, section imaging. So only the signal from the focus in focus light can, will be detected by confocal microscope, confocal and two photon microscope. So yeah, the simple answer is yes. And then the next question is with the IBM, what do you advise for segmenting images and quantifying information? Well, oh, well our, own so our own software has some function, but the, the most use, you know, most versatile software, I believe, is ImageJ. <laughs> yeah, so we, we normally do segmentation and quantification by using ImageJ or other uh, imaging processing software like Imaris. But, you know, Imaris is expensive. So in, in many cases, we just, well, in my group, we normally use ImageJ. And these days, you know, there are many, you know, uh, the deep learning models up there available, freely available. So we use those, you know, uh, AI models as well for automatic segmentation and quantifications. And then, you know, ImageJ is well documented. So if you are really interested in, then it's quite easy to learn how to use the ImageJ. And then there are you know, so many plugins available for ImageJ. Or you know, if you have a you know, very specific you know, uh, task you want to do, 
uh, with the microscope image, please send us an email. So we have done many experience. We have many experience in those kind of analysis. And then we'll be happy to you know, advise you. Uh, oh, another one. Is there a concern for interference such as vibration generated by the animal respiration, which may pose considerable challenge for high speed 3D imaging? Well, yeah, yeah, of course. So, so when you look at the, so this, you know, you know this is quite, uh, quite straightforward. So, this, so when you see this flickering, this is the exact, you know, interference of respiration of mouse. But you know, if you uh, so if, if your imaging system is fast, like ours, then well, at least we can you know distinguish the you know, where we are. <laughs> and then in three D imaging, well, this in but this you know respiration is quite uh, very periodic and then quite periodic and stable. So what we do was we just take a three uh, D imaging, you know, with this respiration, and then we you know remove the out of the uh, uh, out of uh, how can I say out of focus images? And then, well, well our uh, how can I say our no doing oh yeah so our image resolution algorithm is quite good. So if you look at this data, okay, so our uh, image processing algorithm it's actually quite efficient in you know removing those you know out of focus images due to the respiration. So if you look at it, because you know we our our algorithm is uh, is programmed to take the only most stable uh, frames from this video. So you know those you know 3D imaging, well it's not a big problem for us actually. We did this in this most compensation algorithm. Uh, we can deal with those, you know, the respiration, uh, the artifact of the uh, motion artifact due to uh, by the motion, uh, the uh, respiration. Okay. Well, I think I. Uh, I think uh, uh, it's already one hour already. So, and then uh, I, I think uh, I have answered uh, uh, well, most of the question, I believe, all the questions you might have. Okay, so well, thank you very much again. And then if you have any additional question you think of later, just send us an email and then we'll be very happy to answer that. Thank you very much, Professor Kim, mm -hmm. and uh, thank you all for attending this webinar today.